Hello. On behalf of the Women's Week Committee, I'd like to welcome you to the ninth annual Women's Week. We're very excited about the many events that we've planned for this week. We have brochures at the back of the room, and you can also get those at Sloss House and at our information booth in the Union all week. I'd like to make a few announcements at this time. We are still accepting entries for the Women's Week run this Saturday, and you can pick those up at the places I've just mentioned. Also, there will be a reception <coughs> following Pam's lecture that's sponsored by the Women's Week Planning Committee. It will be held at Sloss House. For those of you that don't know where we are, Sloss House is a small brick building just south of Curtis. If you go out the door where the fountain is, it's on the walkway in between the Union and Curtis. Can't miss it. Also, you might notice our interpreter for the deaf, it's Carolyn Stokes, and I'd like to thank her for being here this evening. Our keynote speaker is Pam McAllister, who is editor of the book Reweaving the Web of Life, which is an anthology of writings on feminism and nonviolence. Her book was the inspiration for this year's Women's Week theme, Weaving Peace. Her book will be on sale at the Little Red Bookstore at 118 Hayward. And Pam will be here all week. So you can grab her and make her sign your book for you. <laughs> at the end of Pam's lecture, she will accept a few questions. At this time, I'd like to welcome Pam McAllister. Hi. <clears throat> I'm really excited to be here. This is my first time in Iowa, so, and it looks like such a terrific conference. And uh, like she said, I'm going to be here all week, so I really do want to talk to people and hear what's happening in your lives here, what your concerns are. The complete, uh, I, I always pick really long titles <laughs> for my talks, and so they couldn't fit it all in the brochure. We've just got the second half, so I'll tell you what the whole thing is. Uh, Susan B. Anthony was scared sometimes, too, <laughs> celebrating the courage of peacemaking women. Those of us who attended the 1982 Global Feminist Disarmament Meeting participated in a ritual which was simple but quite profound. One woman at the conference had secretly been designated the peacemaker, and the rest of us were instructed to try to find her by circling the room and greeting each other with the question, are you the peacemaker? Hi, are you the peacemaker? We were told that when we found the designated woman, she would touch our foreheads, ordaining us as sister peacemakers. This sounds like a rather mild exercise, but it was truly a moving experience. Because as we actually began greeting each other, an amazing transformation took place. After only a few minutes, we found ourselves anointing each other Recon recognizing each other as peacemakers, and most importantly, taking that name for our own, nodding yes when asked, are you the peacemaker? Yes, yes, I am. Now I want to describe for you a different greeting. It too had a profound effect on those who used it, as well as those who refused to use it like one teenage girl who was a student when Hitler first came to power. After only a few weeks, the headmaster of her school had issued a new regulation that each morning the students were to greet their teachers by standing at attention with their right arms raised and declare, Heil Hitler! Heil Hitler! But one student, Hildgun Zassenhaus, young as she was, understood the implication of such a regulation, and she refused to cooperate. 
Her friends told her not to take it so seriously. They said, why don't you just raise your arm and mumble something like we do? Nobody will know the difference. Why get into trouble for just this? Still, she refused. She was sent to the principal, who told her that if she didn't cooperate the next morning, she would have to be expelled from school. The next day, and this was springtime, the windows opening into the room were open. When the teacher entered the room, everyone looked at Hildgren. After only a moment's hesitation, she rose suddenly with the others, and in a forceful gesture, she raised her arm, and in doing so, she struck the nearest window. The glass broke, and she was rushed to the hospital with the blood pouring down her arm. Her defiant gesture was an appropriate metaphor, far more appropriate than she could have known that morning. For indeed, the seemingly inconsequential Heil Hitler greeting of these schoolgirls was one steeped in blood. It was a greeting which signaled the conformity of perfectly normal, nice people who would eventually cooperate in the systematic slaughter of millions of their innocent neighbors and friends. In her memoirs, Zassenhaus wrote of that period, you have to have lived in it to be able to imagine it. It's just as if it closes in on you from every side. It was not so much the boots and the brown shirts and the SS men on the streets. It was really more subtle than this. It was between the lines. It was that suddenly you were being molded into a people who were marching at the same pace. It was this demand to give up your individuality. A close friend of the Zassenhaus family had had polio as a boy and could not return the Hitler salute with his right arm. He described the feeling of fear in Germany then. They introduced this funny thing, Heil Hitler, and this replaced the normal greeting between people. And this name, this word, got into every mind, every day. Everyone had to say, Heil Hitler, so his name was always in the brain. This, I want to say, diabolic greeting was associated with loss of freedom and oppression. It paralyzed the capacity to act. This was the background on which all other things developed. Well, eventually, Zassenhaus learned to be more deceptive, too. And she even used the greeting, Heil Hitler, to camouflage her work in the resistance to the Third Reich. But that is another story. Tonight, let us celebrate the courage of this teenager who experienced such anguish when she could so easily have shrugged with her friends and said, well, what difference will it make if I raise my arm or not? Circle the room, searching, searching. Are you the peacemaker? She will touch your forehead, ordaining you. Are you the peacemaker? How will you answer? Let us think about these two greetings for a minute. Are you the peacemaker and Heil Hitler? What images do they conjure? How do they make you feel? What expectations are implicit in the greeting Heil Hitler? What expectations implicit in the question, are you the peacemaker? Certainly, they, they both work to establish an expectation in the people who are greeting each other. And expectations influence what we see and how we'll feel about what we see. Let me give an example. I grew up in a big old farmhouse surrounded by apple trees and cherry orchards. 
And though my parents have moved into this small town nearby, my father still dreams of his ideal, which is something along the lines of Little House on the Prairie. Needless to say, he is certainly dismayed that I have chosen New York City as my home. He's oblivious to the magic that I find there. We have very different expectations of the city, and so we see it differently. I live near a park in Brooklyn, and I walk there often. I see its beauty, the trees and the lake, and the city children jumping rope double dutch. When my father visits, and I take him to the park, he sees the broken glass, the graffiti, the city children mugging the elderly. <laughs> what we expect to see clearly influences what we will see and how we'll feel about that. If we were to greet each other with Heil Hitler, what would we expect to see in each other? If we were to greet each other with, are you the peacemaker? What expectations would we have? In one greeting is the expectation of obedience to authority, and with that, a suspicion or even a condemnation of one who doesn't return the greeting. The other greeting holds the expectation of hope, of finding the best in the person being greeted, and of being reminded of the best in ourselves when that greeting is returned. Another function of these two greetings is that they reflect very different images of individual responsibility in society. The one greeting has the feel of fear, of yielding personal judgment in allegiance to the power of an authoritative other. The greeting, are you the peacemaker, in contrast, has the feel of empowerment of owning responsibility for one's actions. Tonight, I want to guide us in thinking about courage and the tradition of courage and about empowerment and the process of empowerment. In this context, then, I'd like us to think about a study which I believe has great significance for peacemakers, and I know that Many of you will be familiar with, with this study, so let me just refresh your memories. The experiment was conducted by Stanley Milgram at Yale University in the 1960s. The question behind the experiment was, if a person is instructed by an authority figure to carry out a series of acts that come increasingly into conflict with conscience, how far will that person go in complying with the instructions before refusing to cooperate? Here's how the experiment worked. Two people came to a psychology lab to take part in a study supposedly of memory and learning. One was designated a teacher and the other a learner. The experimenter, who was in this case the authority figure, explained that the study was concerned with the effects of punishment on learning. And then he strapped the learner into a chair and attached an electrode to his wrist. Actually, this learner was a mild-mannered, likable man who was trained to play the part of the learner. In other words, he was sort of an actor who had been hired to do this. The real focus of the experiment was the person designated as a teacher, who was a genuinely naive subject, who had innocently volunteered to participate. It was the task of this teacher to ask the learner questions. When the learner answered correctly, the teacher would just continue on with the next question. But when the learner answered incorrectly, the teacher was instructed to administer a shock. These shocks were increased with each incorrect answer. And they ranged from very slight, which was about um, 15 volts, to moderate, strong, 
very strong, intense, extreme, dangerous, and XXX. The actor who played the part of the learner reacted to the shocks that he was supposedly receiving. Actually, again, he really didn't receive any shocks, but the teacher, the, the man who was playing the part of the teacher, believed that the learner was being shocked. At 75 volts, the learner would sort of grunt in discomfort. At 120, he clearly complained. At 150, he demanded to be released from the experiment. And at 285 volts, he screamed in agony. The results of this study were very depressing. Perfectly nice, cooperative people, not sadists, not sickies, felt compelled to follow the orders of the experimenter. And though most of these people were clearly uncomfortable in administering shocks, when they could see the learner writhing and hear him screaming in agony at 285 volts, Still, the majority of them cooperated right through to the 450 volt level marked XXX. It's pretty depressing. Much has been written about this study and its significance. It has been used to demonstrate what Hannah Arendt called the banality of evil. That ordinary people simply doing their jobs without any feelings of hostility, can easily become willing agents of pain and even destruction. The Nazi extermination of the Jews is, of course, the prime example of ordinary people destroying their neighbors and fellow citizens. But of course, we see all the time how easy it is to go along with authority, to shoot women and babies, when commanded in Mi Lai, to join a McCarthy and point the finger of blame at a neighbor who holds unpopular beliefs or has a different lifestyle, to pay the war taxes, which fund the building of MX missiles and the manufacturing of nerve gas. This test showed that it was not just the Germans who had a problem blindly obeying orders. And remember, these test subjects were volunteers, not risking personal harm involved in disobeying a Hitler or a Cali, a Joe McCarthy or, or the IRS. Remember, too, that these subjects could see and hear their victims. How much easier it is to cooperate in hurting or killing those we cannot see, which is the way we wage wars so often today, push-button wars, dropping bombs on people so far away we can't see them, let alone hear their cries. And as we approach the year 1984, we must wonder, too, what will happen when the tools of oppression are familiar, even attractive, Television, one in every home. What a marvelous brainwashing tool it would be in the hands of a handsome Hitler. Computers, right now in South Africa, every fetus is given an identification number to be followed via computer throughout a lifetime of governmental control. How handy computers are and will be to the modern age dictators. Many variations of the Milgram experiment were conducted, but there is one, and actually only one, which I want us to think about tonight because it is a bright note in the midst of all this. And I think it holds significance especially for peacemakers. In this variation, three people were designated to be teachers and as in the first study, the learner who supposedly received the shocks was an actor playing a part. But this time, two of the teachers were also playing a prepared role. And only the one teacher, as before, was actually the naive subject. At the point of administering 
the 150 volt, which was the very strong shock level. The first teacher stood up and walked away, telling the experimenter that he no longer wished to participate with this test because of the learner's complaints. At the 210 volt, which was the very strong shock level, the second teacher got up, expressing concern for the learner and refusing further participation, declaring, I'm not willing to shock that man against his will. I'll have no part of it. The subject was thus given an example of two peers refusing to cooperate with authority. And the results of this test were very different from the first study. Only four out of the 40 continued to the very end, giving a shock of 450 volts. By far, the majority left soon after the other two teachers refused to administer the shocks. The significance of this test is clear. Most people will go along, obedient to authority, even when they are asked to do something that they really don't believe is right, unless someone else sets an example. The good news, then, is that this study illustrates the power of setting an example, the importance of risking the lone action. For clearly, we are influenced by each other, even as we feel pulled to obey authority. It is possible to revive another's conscience, to require another to stop and think and take responsibility for one's own actions. As a pacifist, I feel compelled to point out that this is precisely the strength of nonviolence. That with the one hand, we block. And we say, no, I refuse to cooperate with what you are asking of me. And at the same time, at the same time, we extend the other hand, gesturing a return, and say, I have the faith that you can make this better choice, too. The trick to taking a courageous action, of course, is that at the moment when we must act, when we must push the very boundaries of our own courage, when we feel so very alone, there is no way of knowing if we will influence others to stop and think about what they are being asked to do. No way to know if our lone actions will be lost or if they'll have any meaning at all. The teenage Zassenhaus didn't know the effects of her lonely anguish. She didn't know that she'd ever have the opportunity to write her memoirs and that the story of her questioning would someday be used to illustrate courage in a speech years and years later in Ames, Iowa. What the Milgram test variation should tell us, and what we must have faith in, is that it's the process of taking the courageous action which matters, even when we can't know for sure that our actions will do any good. Are you the peacemaker? Are you the peacemaker? We are anointed by each other, inspired by each other, inspired too by the courageous women who have gone before us. It is said that every speech Mother Jones, the labor organizer, ever gave was really a history lesson so that the working men and women would have a sense that they were part of an ongoing tradition of struggle and would know that their courageous actions we're not isolated. I, too, want to tell the stories that will empower us, lift us out of isolation, sustain us in times of personal despair. But history lessons have a way of leaving us cold. At least they have a way of me, leaving me cold. We hear about this brave deed of, of this great person or that, and we remain observers. 
We study the act and the consequences, but usually we, we have nothing to hold on to, no feelings, nothing that, that feels familiar that we can relate to our own lives. The brave, famous people seem to be distant and are easily written off as experts. If we are to be touched by their examples, we must rescue them from the history books and the encyclopedias. So tonight, let us breathe with them, if only for a minute. Feel the heartbeat of one who, who had to gather her courage before she acted, long before she knew she'd ever be in a history book or be praised for her lonely stand. Let their spirits anoint us as peacemakers, peacemakers who are not afraid to question authority, peacemakers who will not be afraid to rock the boat when we see injustice, peacemakers who will hold out our hands to ordain each other. Let us tell the story of peacemaking women. Let us tell the story of Susan B. Anthony. In our history books, it says that Susan B. Anthony was a leader in the women's rights movement and worked to get women the right to vote. For a while, she published a journal, The Revolution. <coughs> she committed an act of civil disobedience by voting in the 1872 presidential election, long before women were granted that right, and was arrested, stood trial, and found guilty. She worked in support of equal educational opportunities and property rights for women, and she supported dress reform. This is history, important history. But what do we have here but a, a list of Anthony's accomplishments and her various involvements? She was arrested for civil disobedience. Yeah, well, of course, she was Susan B. Anthony. She published a paper called The Revolution. Yeah, yeah, well, of course, you know, she was Susan B. Anthony. But did you know that the great and powerful Susan B. Anthony was plagued by a lack of self-confidence for much of her life. In one letter to her close friend, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, she lamented, oh, that I had the requisite power to do credit to womanhood in this emergency. Why is nature so sparing of her gifts? In another letter, she wrote that she hadn't even started writing her speech for the teacher's convention. Mercy only knows when I'll get a moment. And what is worse, if I get all the time the world has, I can't get up a decent document. Those of you who have the talent to, to honor, to do honor to poor womanhood, have left poor brainless me to do battle alone. It is a shame. I've just engaged to attend a progressive meeting in Erie County on the 1st of September just because there is no other woman to be had and not because I feel in the least bit competent. Not only did Susan lack self-confidence, she even had moments of despair and discouragement. Sound familiar? She wrote to Stanton, I can't remember whether I have answered your last letter or not. Be that as it may, I will remember how good a word it brought to me and how it cheered me onward. And I long, I have very weak moments and long to lay my weary head somewhere and nestle my full soul close to another in full sympathy. I sometimes fear that I too shall faint by the wayside and drop out of the ranks of the faithful few there is so much, mid all that is so hopeful, to discourage and dishearten, and I feel alone. You will see that this is one of my tired moments. Ah, here is a woman to whom I can relate. These little passages breathe life into the dry and distant Susan B. Anthony. I can relate to a woman who lacked self-confidence. 
I can relate to a woman who got tired and who sometimes felt very much alone. And now when I read that she committed an act of civil disobedience, I don't shrug and say, well, of course. Instead, I think, if Susan B. Anthony, a woman who was scared sometimes too, if she could take such an action, perhaps, well, maybe I could risk such actions too. Let us celebrate the courage of this woman who devoted her life to the cause of women's rights and who did this despite her feelings of inadequacy and her fears. What if Susan's friend, Elizabeth Cady Stanton? In the history books we read that she was one of the organizers of the first women's rights convention held in 1848, and that she was married to an abolitionist leader. We read that she was one of the founders of the National Women's Suffrage Association and for a while served as its president. The history book does not mention that she had seven children to care for as she wrote her brilliant essays and speeches. In one letter, she asked Susan to find a lawyer to do a bit of research for her because she could not, she did not have the opportunity to do the research herself. And she wrote, you see, while I am about the house, surrounded by my children, washing dishes and baking and sewing, I can think up many points, but I cannot search books. For my hands, as well as my brains, would be necessary for that work. As she neared the end of one project, she wrote, ah, prepare yourself to be disappointed in its merits. For I seldom have one hour undisturbed in which to sit and write. You can tell this sounds familiar too. Right? Men who can, when they wish to write a document, shut themselves up for days with their thoughts and their books, know little of what difficulties a woman must surmount to get off a tolerable production. Something else the history books don't mention is that her father, her husband, and most of her close friends opposed her work on women's rights. She wrote to Susan, I passed through a terrible scourging when last at my father's. I cannot tell you how deep the iron entered my soul. I never felt more keenly the degradation of my sex. Sometimes, Susan, I struggle in deep waters. <coughs> Let us celebrate the courage of this woman who was one of the great thinkers and radicals of her day, and who was also a woman who had difficulty finding a room of her own, an hour to herself, a woman who faced the daily ridicule of those she most deeply loved. Circle the room, searching, searching, a flesh and blood woman she was born into slavery probably sometime during the year 1797 and was called Isabella until the day when, as a free woman, she realized she had been called by God to be a sojourner for truth. And so this woman, who could neither read nor write, traveled the land as one of our great orators. The occasion for which she is most often remembered was the Women's Rights Convention in Akron, Ohio in 1854. Those were indeed difficult times. The feminist cause was most unpopular, and the planners of the convention were afraid that the presence of a black woman, an uneducated ex-slave known for speaking her mind, would discredit the convention 
confuse the already unpopular issue. They were afraid that their cause would be linked to the abolitionist cause, as it had been in other cities, God forbid. They begged the convener not to recognize Sojourner Truth if she indicated a desire to speak. But on the second day of the conference, after hearing the local clergymen, one after the other, stand to denounce women's rights and explain that women were created the weaker sex and were meant to obey and be taken care of by the men, Sojourner Truth rose, walked slowly to the front, laid her bonnet at her feet, and turned to be recognized. And despite the urgent request that she be denied, she was announced as the next speaker. In a few short sentences, she exposed the inconsistencies of all that she'd been listening to by eloquently stating the obvious she was able to stop people from just nodding their heads and to make them think. And she said, and I'm sure I can't do this the way she did, but I will try. That man over there says that women need to be helped into carriages and lifted over ditches and to have the best place everywhere. Nobody, nobody ever helps me into carriages or over mud puddles, or gives me any best place, and ain't I a woman? Look at me, look at my arm. I have plowed and planted and gathered into barns, and no man could head me. And ain't I a woman? I could work as much and eat as much as a man when I could get it, and bear the lash as well. And ain't I a woman? I have borne five children and seen them most all sold off into slavery. And when I cried out with a mother's grief, none but Jesus heard. And ain't I a woman? Sojourner Truth had the wisdom and the courage to understand the links between the fight for black rights and the fight for women's rights. And she refused to let that vision be fragmented. But Sojourner Truth, she was just not a Wonder Woman, born with effortlessly clear insights. In fact, during the 29 years that she was Isabella the slave, she was not only timid and subservient, but she even believed the slavery was right and honorable. Her fellow slaves called her the white man's nigger and scorned her for always obeying the man who owned her, a man that she loved and believed was very like God. So there's a lot to celebrate in this story because it tells us that we have the ability to change. Here was a woman who from the very day she was born was trained to obey authority without question, trained with the whip. For 29 years, she was told she couldn't think for herself. And yet, she became a woman, not only able to think for herself and to question authority, but able to inspire others to question as well. So let us celebrate the courage of this woman who opted for speaking the whole truth and resisted the fragmented vision of her slave master, the fragmented vision of the abolitionists afraid of women's rights and the feminists afraid of black rights. Let us celebrate the courage of Sojourner Truth who rooted her voice in rage, rage against the injustice she met at every turn and who transformed that rage into a healing power. Our stories of courage are not without their moments of humor. What do we know of the British suffrage movement? 
Perhaps we recognize the name Emmeline Pankhurst or know about the horrible forced feedings, the marches, the window breakings. But let me read Pankhurst's own account of an action taken at the London Opera's gala performance of Joan of Arc for the king. Our women took advantage of the occasion to make one of the most successful demonstrations of the year. A box was secured directly opposite the royal box, and this was occupied by three women, beautifully gowned. On entering, they managed, without attracting the slightest attention, to lock and barricade the door. And at the close of the first act, as the orchestra had disappeared, the women stood up, and one of them, with the aid of a megaphone, addressed the king, calling attention to the impressive scenes on the stage. The speaker told the king that women were today fighting as Joan of Arc fought centuries ago for human liberty, and that they, like the Maid of Orleans, were being tortured and done to death in the name of the king, in the name of the church, and with the full knowledge and responsibility of established government. The vast audience was thrown into a panic of excitement and horror. And amid a perfect turmoil of cries and adjurations, the door of the box was finally broken down and the women ejected. As soon as they had left the house, others of our women, to the number of 40 or more, rose to their feet Oh, wait, they had been sitting quietly in an upper gallery, rose to their feet and rained suffrage literature on the heads of the audience <laughs> below. It was fully three quarters of an hour before the excitement subsided and the singers could go on with the opera. Well, while we are rescuing these British suffragettes from their brief and dry mention in the history books, let us rescue the notion of courage. In the thesaurus, Courage stands beside such words as valor, gallantry, heroism, rashness, manhood, manliness, grit, and hardihood. Hardihood, I. Eh? <laughs> but the courage we're celebrating tonight has more to do with compassion, healing, questioning, change, creativity. Let us celebrate the courage of these women who dared to be creative and unladylike and outrageous. What do we know of Jane Addams? We're told in our history books that she founded Hull House, a sort of neighborhood center for Chicago's immigrants, that she set up all sorts of programs there from day nurseries to college courses. We're also told that she was instrumental in promoting labor and housing reforms. She was a writer, an active worker for women's suffrage, a pacifist who served as president of the Women's International League for Peace and Freedom. And in 1931, she was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize. So many words about a great but distant woman. We mark up the list of her accomplishments, and perhaps we are impressed, but not really so much, because after all, she was Jane Addams great name in our history books. But let us return to that little mention of her pacifism. Jane Addams went to Europe in the early days of World War I and saw soldiers there who were questioning the notion that their fighting and dying would be a reasonable method of solving an international difficulty. Upon returning to the United States, she mentioned in a speech 
that because they were hesitant to engage in the barbaric hand-to-hand -hand combat that was expected of them, the English soldiers were commonly given rum, the Germans ether, and the French boys absinthe. Only with such assistance could they perform these brutal tasks. Jane was reporting her observations 